Hello everyone and welcome back to Superboy Beyond and we are returning to season two today with another of our commentaries. This isn't a great episode but it's not a bad one either. This is one of our sort of, uh, I think we put it as a guilty pleasure type episode because the episode itself, as we've spoken about in the past, isn't actually that good but the central performance by Mark Holton is just so much fun. He's just so charismatic so... Yeah, this is going to be a fun, interesting commentary for us today. Uh, If this is your first time watching one of our commentaries, it's not going to be like a typical YouTube reaction video. You're not actually going to see or hear the episode, although you will see like a heavily filtered version up there in the middle. Uh, But that's purely so you can keep in time with us. It's in no way a replacement for the actual episode. You will need your own episode of Superboy in order to watch along with us. We'll count you in with a 3-2-1 play. As long as we hit play at the same time, we'll all be good. So yep. get ready. Superboy, Casanova, uh, Johnny, Casanova and the Secret Serum in three, two, one, play. Been a little while since I've seen this one, but I could have sworn that we'd already done a commentary on it. I think it's probably probably the you know we, we're just thinking about it because you know we had that great commentary well a comment from uh, from Mark Jones who actually cast Mark Holton I think in Leprechaun because of this yeah I think it was yeah I vaguely remember the comment saying it was definitely that way around it was a direct result of working with him on this. Yeah. Which is always fun, you know. It's always good finding those connections. One thing I always appreciate with Superboy is when we get to actually see a different part of the Schuster campus. Because, let's face it, a lot of the time it's just the dorm room. Occasionally it'll be that fountain that Lex and Leo got pushed into. Uh, you know, it's you basically have the same locations a of that here and there. Yeah, like you know, Peterson's lab maybe returns a couple of times. But let's face it, most of the time it's just that sort of grassy area from Alien Solution. And it's just repeated over and over. But here we get the tennis courts, there's an episode with a swimming pool, you know. I just like how it fills out and just makes it feel like a real sort of college campus tell oh tell a play by mark jones oh you were right we were talking about this before the before the show folks uh we couldn't remember if Ilya actually had uh, a writing credit on this and he did i, I could I, I couldn't i couldn't remember anything other than the uh, the two dracula episodes that he had you know a hand in writing Yeah, I thought that he'd got a writing credit, or at the very least, I thought we had a story by credit on this one, just purely because I vaguely remember us talking about season two at one point, and I think I theorised that, you know, that was an Elias kind of idea, that maybe he was just like, let's do Jekyll and Hyde meets the Nazi professor, but let's do it the other way round. And it's just like, it's, it's a very producer sort of idea, isn't it, you know? Yeah. Although, let's face it, we have talked in the past about the fact that despite quite enjoying this episode, there are some iffy things about it, that's for sure. Yeah, I mean, just the acting in this scene is very... The guy dying is doing a great job. He is, He's and... The lighting works well. I don't know if it's makeup that they've put on him or if it's just the fact that they've got that blue light on his face, but he does look like he's dying. Um, yeah, but yeah. the guy who's playing Johnny Ivanisak is just meh. 
I suppose he doesn't have to be particularly good at acting. All the role really required was he needs to be handsome so that it's, you know, a contrasting change when he becomes Johnny Casanova. Yeah. Although I don't think he's terrible. I've seen much worse on this show. Yes. One Scott Wells. Even not even just in season one. Like I have seen worse performances. I mean, he's, he's just a little bit. He's bland. Yeah. But maybe that maybe maybe that's what is helping him to. You know, pull off the, the difference between the character is he's purposely playing him in, as bland. Mm. I mean, that's something that when they made um, Star Trek Voyager, the human actors were told many times, like, you know, you need to downplay all your emotions. You need to be very almost wooden, just purely because all the alien characters with that makeup would have to be over the top and it would help them feel more alive. <coughs> Excuse me. And apparently the actor that plays Harry Kim was actually uh, reprimanded by the producers multiple times because he was putting in too much emotion. <laughs> Yeah. It's like you've been warned. But anyway, here is Mark Holton, and he's already just chewing the scenery. It's interesting to note, though, that unlike, you know, Jekyll and Hyde, he's not becoming, you know, evil. No, he's just. I don't know. He's um, a little bit scummy at times because he knows that nobody can resist him. But, yeah, he, he's not a bad guy, really. I'd still like to know how, how his clothes change whenever he drinks the, the formula. Yeah. I guess that's one of those things where we just have to suspend our disbelief. Yeah. Because as far as I remember, like, Jekyll and Hyde's clothes never change. Until until uh, Edward actually just changed out of Henry's clothes. Yeah. It's almost a shame that they didn't, didn't just, you know, design the original outfit so that when it was on both actors, he could just undo a few buttons and it was just like a dramatic difference in, you know, maybe the original Johnny could have dressed very formal, like his green shirt could have been buttoned to the top, maybe even had a tie or something. But then when he becomes Casanova, maybe the buttons unrip, the tie remo gets removed. Yeah, but you got to look at this suit that he's wearing. It's really... Yeah. But then, you know, the original Johnny wasn't the best dressed man. <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's part of his charm. You know, he's an eccentric dresser or something. That is the absolute worst way to eat pie. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I didn't remember. You I gotta, didn't think. You gotta look at this formula. It's bringing out all of his inhibitions. Yeah, I love it. I just, I, I didn't think there was a wrong way to eat pie, but I guess that's it. And this just proves how great of an actor Mark Holton is because he goes from from playing a complete jerk like Francis in Pee-wee's Big Adventure and now he's playing essentially he's playing a nice guy with jerky mm. character traits. Yeah, he's a little bit full of himself, he's a bit cocky and overconfident. Part of the thing I like about it is he's he's very immature, but at the same time, he's playing the role like an extremely handsome man. You know, like he's just the smoothest guy in the world, can get any woman he wants. Like he's playing it like a much more attractive person. It's, it's just it's a, it's a really fun thing. Like if this guy was playing it that way, I'm sure he would have no problem seducing Lana. <laughs> Thank you. 
I'm surprised he had to run out, though, because I thought he took the potion with him. Well, it, it could be that the potion is kind of like, you know, our man's uh, Miraclo pills, where he can't take another one for another hour, at least. Maybe. And I love how Lana is just head over heels in love with this guy. Mm. <laughs> and Andy's is... not liking it. No, but I'll tell you what, that's one of Andy's funnier moments, I've got to say. But it looks like he took the formula again. Hmm. <laughs> he is playing it like a child, really, isn't he? You know, yeah, almost like a child's idea of what a sophisticated man would be. You know, they see the movies with. The, the old style films with the suave sort of charismatic debonair men. And this is what the kid takes away from all of it. Just, just useless charm, just combined with idiocy. <laughs> and I've got to say just all the um, one-off actors that are in this, like the guy there playing the, uh, well, I suppose he's a taxi driver, but he was robbing him earlier, I'm sure. No, he, like was he was a hitman. <clears throat> oh, he was a hitman posing as a taxi driver. But, I mean, just all these extra characters that just come in for, like, one scene. It's like Mark Holton's energy in this episode just infects everybody, and it's it's great. Yeah. And that is a fun element as well, just how slobbish he is. And it seems that the only one that that the that the charisma that the formula imbues is not working on is Clark. Yeah. It is funny, just all of his humour are just like playground jokes, you know. Jokes little kids would say. If any other man was doing this, Lana would be freaking out and, and be like, ew, yuck. But this formula is like is like a love potion. Yeah. It almost feels like this would have been a good sort of Mitch's Pitlick episode. Mm. Like just almost like this should have been the sequel to the original Meet Mixie because he's after Lana. Superboy is not affected, but everyone around is. I don't know. It could have been a fun mixy story. Yeah. I'm still trying to figure out how it is that Clark started figuring out that this is Johnny Ivanasek. Essentially in disguise, almost. Yeah, he seems to connect the dots very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Like, maybe I could understand it if the clothes hadn't changed. Like, if they had the same outfit, because Clark had seen him earlier that day. So if he was like, this Johnny Casanova's wearing the same outfit that that other guy was wearing earlier, that might have been a connection to start piecing it together. But there's basically nothing to connect them at this point. 
at least that we've seen. Maybe there's a deleted scene somewhere that explains it. You know, when we finally do get Mark Jones on the show, we're going to have to ask him about that. Yeah. Or it might just be that Clark's very clever and he noticed the name was an act was just the same name backwards or something. He knows there's something suspicious about this guy. Maybe his super brain made the connection a bit faster. <laughs> <laughs> I love how many cigars he's just dropping on the floor everywhere. Like he dropped one in Clark and Andy's dorm room earlier. Like those are huge cigars. Those things are expensive. Yeah. Like, where is he? I suppose he's just like people are just giving him cigars, probably. Yeah, this this formula is definitely got elements of you know being drunk to it. Oh, definitely. Yeah, it's a sort of nutty professor, Jekyll and Hyde, almost uh, naked time type thing from Trek, like, and naked now, I guess. Yeah. And that's one thing I like, you know, he's, you can tell while he's, He's probably not a good person. You could tell he's not a bad one because even though it's dangerous, like he was going anyway. He probably shouldn't have let Lana come with him, but I suppose Lana can take care of herself at this point. gotta say that is a strange outfit clark is wearing just that tie and that shirt yeah and the i fact suppose it is the sleeves, 80s yeah and the sleeves on the jacket are too short <laughs> but then i really shouldn't talk about clark's outfit in an episode where johnny casanova is wearing that now that guy has a great voice He sounds almost like a combination of Arturo from Sliders. <laughs> Maybe just a little bit of James L. Jones mixed in. I wonder what else that actor's done. He sounds a little bit like um, Uncle Phil as well from Fresh Prince. Mm. Bit over the top. I mean, it's not the best performance, but I love his voice. <laughs> well, he doesn't I'd need love... to have the best performance here. I mean, you got Mark Holton chewing up the scenery here. Absolutely. I love how the end part of that. And smoke cigars with him. <laughs> but I love that that end of the sentence was almost a question. Like he was almost confused that he was saying it. <laughs> it was just great. And it also seems like the boss here is not affected by the by the formula either. Hmm. Yeah, it's funny how it's not affecting him. I mean, did, had he used it himself prior? Mm. Does that give you an immunity if you use it once yourself? Hopefully we didn't just talk over the explanation for it.
And now the formula is wearing off again. I'd still like to know how Superboy found them. Super hearing, I guess. I mean, Clark heard them leave. I guess he could have been following from a distance or something. Oh wait, had had he told Lana earlier on that they were friends, those two? The two versions of himself? Is that how Clark knew a few things earlier? He actually told Lana that he was that he, that what Casanova told her that he, Ivana that uh, that Ivanasek and him were cousins. That's right. why he was looking into the murder. So maybe yeah, maybe that's how Clark found out a few things. I will point this out. You know, you've said this before. He does look a little too old to be in college. But that was a recurring issue with Superboy, wasn't it? There was always those characters that look far too old to have been there. And mm. sometimes you can just blame it on the fashion or the hairstyles, you know, but Sometimes I think they just miscast the actors. They just cast a few people that were just a little bit too old. But yeah, there it is. Johnny Casanova. Uh, one of those episodes that I probably give a higher score than it perhaps deserves, just purely because I think this is just a perfect example of the kind of episode where the story, even the script, it doesn't have to be anything award-winning if you have the right actor in your guest role the entire episode just can be elevated based on a central performance and mark holton i think absolutely delivers in this episode i, I just think he's so charismatic i think he just owns the screen every time he's on it um yeah yeah it bumps I... it up from maybe a five or a six up to maybe a seven for me I would agree with you on that. I mean, there are there are definite holes in the in the in the script. You know, you know, how did Clark start putting things together? It's just a little too too quick. You know, you know. See, I just wonder if there's a deleted scene or just a deleted moment of dialogue. Maybe Lana just mentions the fact that they're cousins to Clark, and that moment was just deleted or something. Yeah, I don't know maybe, when it would have happened. Yeah, it and maybe just maybe. Because remember, the guys know Johnny. Yeah. So maybe Clark knows. Wait a minute. He doesn't have any. He doesn't have a cousin. That's yeah. a little odd. Or even yeah. just knowing there's a connection, and then all Clark would have to do is just notice that one name is just the other one backwards. Yeah. Um, which is weird because part of me thinks that Casanova should have been the name of the original guy because. Obviously, having it reversed, that's not a name. The guy's original surname. Yeah. Casanova is obviously a famous one. But, I mean, what a coincidence that his name backwards just happens to be Casanova. Yeah. <laughs> it's almost like it should be the other way around. But, uh, obviously, then it wouldn't make for quite as interesting a story, I suppose. But, um, yeah, no, I just think this is a really fun episode. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it... it... It has its moments where it's absolutely amazing. I mean, that just that scene with, with the uh, with the hitman. He pulls a gun on him when he's J Johnny A, but later on when he's Johnny C, 
They're on the hood of the car. <laughs> they're eating. They're, they're, they're eating donuts. They're laughing. Yeah, brilliant. I mean, and and the scene with the henchman and the mob boss guy, like, yeah, just that line about I just I kind of want to hang out with him, smoke cigars, you know. Just that moment is just great. It's it's just really funny. Yeah, and, and just, uh, just the way that that one actor just plays it, because as you as you point out, he's he's like asking a question. I want to do that. Yeah. But he doesn't seem to be too against it either at the same time. He, he's a little bit confused as to why he's saying it, but he doesn't seem too bothered by it. Like they're yeah. more than happy to hang out with Johnny because he just has this aura about him, I guess. Yeah. Um, this aura of charisma. Yeah. And uh, I do want to make special mention as well, just again of the, uh, the mob boss, just purely because I think he just had this, great voice um i'm surprised that he's not had like a longer career maybe as a voice actor or something you know um but yeah he's literally got something like six appearances like throughout the show and uh, i mean no six appearances total on his imdb sorry like that's all the acting work he's done according to this Mm. Um, and I've not heard of the Chad Effect, Fortune Hunter, Thunder in Paradise, Welcome Freshman, or Super Super Force. Um, so Super I don't Force know. Is the uh, the show that later was uh, paired up with Superboy on Channel Nine here in uh, in New York. Mm. Um, it was basically Iron Man on a motorcycle. That actually sounds quite fun. <laughs> For the first yeah. season, it was not bad. For the second, it it was a little bit off because they started introducing psychic powers. Hmm. Although they did bring in uh, Musetta Vander. I don't know who that is. Well, she she's very... You remember Star Trek Voyager, the episode where Harry breaks uh, the Prime Directive by having sex with that woman? <laughs> I don't remember that episode. <laughs> well, they, they met up with a colony ship that was just basically the ship was the entire colony. Right. And yeah, the ship. Helped, yeah. The ship helped them fix, fix the Voyager and the Voyager helped them fix their ship. And the right. woman that he has sex with is Musetta Vander. And she is okay. a very famous actress. Hmm. So, yeah, I, I don't know Michael Marzella from anything else. Um, Apparently he was in two episodes of Superboy. Uh, the other time he was just doing a voice. Apparently he was the voice of the creature in Power of Evil. Oh, yeah. Which makes sense. Like, it's a pretty good voice for an evil creature, you know. I got to say his, his performance as the voice of the creature was better than this. Yeah, I, although I like his performance in this, I think he is a lot of fun. And he is just perfectly in keeping with the tone of the episode. I don't know if that version of the character would have worked anywhere else in the season, but it works here because it just feels like it's part of the fabric of this story. Yeah. But, um, yeah, the voice of the creature in Power of Evil. Um, he Obviously, that was only episode 11, of season two, whereas this is the second to last episode. So yeah. clearly he was hired for a voice gig. Maybe his IMDB is just incomplete. Maybe he had like, like a load of radio credits or something that just aren't listed for whatever reason. Right. Um, yeah. If you're familiar, anyone out there with the work of Michael Marzella. Or if know. you are Michael Marzella, please drop us I mean, a comment. How funny would that be if he showed up in this, in our comments section? <laughs> <laughs> but no, he, he just, I think he had a great voice, a fun presence on screen. And yeah, he just had a little bit of uh, Arturo, I forget the name of the actor, the guy who was also John Reese Davies. John Reese Davies, that's right. Like it's a little bit of him mixed with a little bit of James L. Jones. And uh, with yeah. some hints of Uncle Phil from Fresh Prince. Yeah, just a little bit. And uh, yeah, it's very over the top. It's very cartoony. He's very much sort of a comic book mob boss rather than uh, anything that you could class as realistic. But as I say, perfectly fits in the tone of this episode. I wouldn't have changed it. I think he does just a dynamite job. And I do kind of wish that he uh, 
had appeared in more episodes. Maybe did a few, a few more voices because let's face it, there's plenty of times in the show where they cast people just for a voice because it's like a visual effect element. Yeah. So, Imagine if he was the voice of the alien from the alien solution. That would have been much better because the voice of the alien alien solution, while it's not terrible, the accent is a little bit iffy because it's kind of weird that they're playing an alien from space, but with like a stereotypical sort of Japanese accent. It's just kind of only when he was in the Japanese body. Yeah, but I mean, even that body wasn't Japanese. It just had elements of that in the armor. Yeah. Like it was an alien. <laughs> but I mean, they had the exact, it's, it's very similar to the accent that all the members of the Trade Federation from the Star Wars prequels had. It's very much just that same voice. Right. It's just got a slightly different filter over it. Mm. But um, yeah, now that having Michael Marzello as. Um, as that voice might have actually improved things a little bit. Um, yeah. When, when I was say it said earlier that his voice was reminding me of James L. Jones, it's funny because I'm not even really thinking of Darth Vader in that. I'm thinking of James L. Jones as the voice of the Unas in Stargate, just because they had a similar sort of over the top way of um, pronouncing like all the vowels and all the consonants in the, each word. like, it was very, very clearly well spoken, but um, that's the episode with, slightly... with the hammer of Thor, right? Yeah, they get trapped in like a labyrinth, and he's the voice of like this um, reptilian creature that the ghouls used to inhabit before humans. Yeah, they brought back that species later, and I did like the episodes later, but I don't think James L. Jones voiced them in those, I think it was other actors after that. Mm. Either way, though, fun episode. Yeah. Do you have anything else you want to say on Johnny Casanova before we move on? No, I, th I, th I think th I think we I th we've said everything there could possibly be. Although I will say this, mm -hmm. Mark Jones, if you ever do happen to see this, which I think you will, uh, maybe at some point. Line, and uh, we'd love to have you on to uh, to another commentary of this very episode. Yeah, yeah, maybe in a couple months' time when we. Uh... Because obviously we're working our way through just all the episodes we haven't done so far. And then we're going to go right back to season one, episode one, and do them in order. So uh, we will be circling back to this episode at some point. So yep. uh, we would love to have him on the show separate anyway, um, just as an interview type thing. But uh, anyway, thank you all so much for watching. The only thing I do remember that I wanted to say on this episode is just that I do think it's kind of weird that Superboy gave Johnny the potion back. I mean, I guess he knows that Johnny Casanova isn't a bad guy, so how much harm could he really do? But, I mean, he could probably do quite a bit of harm without meaning to. Yeah, I, this, is, this isn't, you know, like, you know, you know, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde in the sense mm. that Edward Hyde here isn't completely evil. You know? Still, just the amount of mischief he could get up to, just even inadvertently, like without even meaning to cause trouble, like he could just ha get the wrong person distracted at the wrong time, you know. And it's just who knows what could happen. I just think it's kind of strange to give him the potion back. Yeah, um, seems to me that that potion, just by virtue of the fact that that sort of gangster looking guy wanted it so badly. It's probably one of those things that's too dangerous for anybody actually to have. Like, he, he wanted it for very good reason. Like, he would basically be unstoppable at that point. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm just... If I was Superboy, I would have destroyed it with my heat vision. That's just me. Anyway, thank you all so much for watching our commentary on Johnny Casanova and the Secret Serum. And uh, not sure what we'll be watching next week. Maybe Bride of Bizarro. We'll see, because we realised earlier that we've yet to watch that one. So, yeah, we'll see you then. Goodbye. <laughs>